Uh, we are co-sponsoring today uh, a talk by Elizabeth King. Um, we are very pleased to have her here. Um, she's an economist and has been recently selected to be the Director of Education at the World Bank. Um, uh, earlier, she was the manager of the research group at the bank that focuses on human development. Uh, she has a BA from the University of the Philippines and a PhD in economics from Yale University. Uh, in her work at the World Bank, she's worked on uh, issues in a number of countries from Bangladesh, Colombia, Ghana, Indonesia, Nicaragua, Pakistan, and the Philippines. Um, she's worked in a number of areas kind of in uh, human capital and development, economics of education. Um, and I think she brings to us both a, a vast amount of kind of academic and technical uh, expertise, but also I think some very interesting uh, real world uh, experience uh, working with countries um, and organizations to help them uh, further develop their education systems. I look forward to hearing her talk. I, the way we usually uh, do these um, events is uh, Dr. King will uh, have uh, a bit of time to talk. You could say whether you take questions during or after. We go till 5.30, and so we probably maybe leave 20 minutes or 25 minutes at the end for questions. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank again uh, the International Policy Center for um, uh, helping uh, support this event and organize it, and to Bonnie Roberts and uh, Tom Avaco of Close Up for uh, doing uh, all of the uh, hard logistical work. So thank you very much, and Dr. King. Good afternoon, thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to have been invited to give this uh, talk. Uh, I'm terribly excited to be able to share with you some of the things that, that uh, I've been doing at the World Bank, that the World Bank does uh, for development and in particular for education. Uh, as uh, Professor Jacob said, I've just been, uh, I've just gotten a new job within the World Bank. The World Bank is an very active internal labor market. And uh, so I've just been selected to be the director for, for education uh, for, for the bank, which means to say I'm a, the, uh, the, I guess, the senior spokesperson for the work that we do on education. And also, um, supposedly, to try to think about the strategy that the World Bank is going to be doing on the education sectors and the countries that we work in. So you are, uh, I'm here talking about an issue in a very uh, enthusiastic uh, way because this is sort of my, the honeymoon in my period in this new job. And I'm really very excited about the challenges that it presents. So um, let me see. Okay. I've been instructed in the of this uh, presentation. I thought I would share with you one uh, part of a book that I really loved, when, which I read uh, before I even thought about writing anything on education. And this was, I don't know how many of you have read this book by Nepal called A House for Mr. Biswas. This was a, a, a quote that, from that book, which I thought was a wonderful thing. Says so this education is a hell of a thing, uh, the main character says. Any little child could pick up. There's no typo there. That's the exact uh, quotation. And yet the blasted thing, referring to education, does turn out so damn important later on. And I thought that that, even when I read it when I wasn't that interested in education, I thought that that was a very nice summing up, I thought, of what education uh, does for, for, for people. So I wanted to start with that and to say that um, this is not really a roadmap. It's really basically a, a list of some of the things that I would like to discuss with you. One, would, one is the, uh, uh, the current issues in education right now. Uh, one, another is the obstacles and challenges that face governments in trying to improve education in their countries. And then third would be some of the solutions that governments uh, have, have been doing and some of the things that the World Bank has been participating in as well. So I'll start with a bunch of 
numbers, basically laying out some of the issues that confront uh, the countries in the developing world. Here's, a, here's a, a, ma uh, a graph that just shows the percentage of household heads with no education. And you can see from the left side going from the, uh, the industrial world uh, to uh, southern Africa, or Africa, not exactly southern. In fact, it's Western Af West Africa, uh, Mali, Burk Burkina Faso being on the rightmost. So you can see in Benin, 60% of household heads still have no education. And here also I've selected four countries, two on this graph and two more later, which, which, have, which show a, a, a very different uh, progress over time in years of schooling. So one of the things we will notice for these four countries is that years of schooling have been rising for men and women for urban and rural residents. So the four uh, curves in each graph stands for uh, Rural, male, rural, female, urban, male, urban, female. You can see for Brazil how that has been. Uh, you can see that the uh, urban and uh, basically it's not, a, it's an urban-rural difference rather than a male-female uh, difference over, over this period. Although you, you do see that um, there's some catch-up happening with respect to rural females uh, for the later years. Sorry about the, the years are kind of uh, overlapping there, but it goes from 1935 to uh, the late 70s. So these are for adults. That's why uh, it's, uh, the data are, seem to be older. These are cohorts. These are birth cohorts of, of people. These are the years when, people, when the adults were born. And you see in Zimbabwe that uh, that looks quite different from the profile in Brazil you see much more of a dispersion between men and women, even within urban or within rural areas. And take a look at Jordan and take a look at the Philippines over time. So in Jordan, you see the beginning to be, a, the, the beginning the, for the oldest adults, uh, patterns look, uh, patterns look uh, a lot more similar to um, Zimbabwe or earlier, but the ending, and part for the for the youngest adults, you see really a convergence of male and female urban and rural years of schooling. In the Philippines, you see also a bit of a convergence, but really the the differences are very similar to what we saw earlier uh, for for Brazil, which is uh, a lot more uh, uh, difference between urban and rural than between men and women. So urban-rural uh, gaps are very large, but we see that they are closing over time. And this uh, table just indicates uh, what some of what's happening here. So for these are percentage differences between urban-rural, uh, these are population-weighted differences. And you see that from the older group, it was 30, um, 33 percentage points difference going down to 28 percentage points difference. And male-female gaps are a lot smaller on average, and they are also closing over time. So I'm one person who's actually looked a lot at gender differences, but really those gender differences are much larger when you look at rural areas than when you look at urban areas. Here are uh, school survival rates. So the way to read this, for example, for Indonesia, is that uh, almost everyone in Indonesia goes to grade one. And then th this is the proportion of students who remain in school. And we see that uh, this big drop between grade six and seven. And really, that's the end of the primary level. And and the different curves here correspond to different uh, income groups. So the, the highest curve pers uh, is, uh, pertains to the 20% richest group in Indonesia. And the lowest one pertains to the 20% poorest group in the population. And that's the same for these four graphs. But you can see how different, again, Indonesia looks from Nicaragua, where 
even at the beginning you see a big difference between uh, the poorest and the richest quintile. But you still see the point of this, uh, of this figure is really to look at what a big transition obstacle going from primary to secondary level is for, for these countries. We see that in Indonesia, in Nicaragua, in Tanzania, in Pakistan, although here it's not quite as pronounced because in fact you do have over, even from the, from the early uh, grades in, at the primary level, you already see a children leaving school every year. They don't stay in school to complete the, the primary cycle. What are the challenges then? What, what, what's, what's going on here? So one is that the, you have growing enrollment rates over time, but what that means is also a bigger demand for more classrooms, more teachers, more textbooks, and we are talking about countries that still have pretty high fertility rates. And you can see that first uh, as on a, gl a global picture is take a look at the population distribution between uh, more developed countries and less developed countries. And you can see that by the year 2000, how many more, you know, the, the, the world is, 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 much more of the world is really in the less developed countries. This is a, an age pyramid, age and sex pyramid, and you can see the huge difference in the demographic profile between West Africa and Western Europe. And this different demographic profile correspond to very different challenges for the education systems in these two regions. Uh, you might guess from this that because the bottom of the pyramid for West, West Africa is very much larger, very much wider, that for many years to come, the government will have to, will have to build classrooms, hire teachers, provide textbooks for a much larger proportion of their population than Western Europe. And even within countries, th there will be changes. India in the year 2000 is going to look different from India in 2020. You can see that uh, certainly uh, uh, an aging of the population, that the bulk here, you have the widest part of the pyramid, and that's going to start moving up as fertility rates come down. And you don't see it as much for the Congo, so that means to say that the fertility rates aren't going to be changing very much. So again, for India and for Congo, the, the challenges for the future for the government will be quite different. A second uh, obstacle is, is poverty in these countries. Poverty reduces the demand for education because uh, education, even though public education is free, it's not really free. It's, uh, uh, first, there are still direct costs that families have to pay for, but also there are opportunity costs of going to school. Um, the families want to have their children at home to take care of younger children or to work on the farm or uh, earn extra money uh, in whatever way. I've shown you uh, some of the uh, uh, differences between the richest quintile and the, and the poorest quintiles in the population. This is an example from Indonesia. You do see that over time, even, oh, sorry, over time even the poor are actually experiencing an increase in enrollment rates at the primary level, the junior secondary level, and even at the senior secondary level. Those are big, change, big improvements over time. But yet when you compare the, the richest with the poorest, you still see that gaps remain. Again, just emphasizing, bringing back the graphs I showed you earlier, here you see that there are big differences between the richest 20% and the poorest 20% percent of the populations, but they show up in different places. In some countries such as Pakistan, you see those differences even at the beginning of the primary cycle, whereas in Indonesia you see, you see the gaps uh, mainly beginning at the junior secondary level. Third is that the, just bringing the, the students to school doesn't mean that they actually learn something. The poor Poor quality of schools uh, and poor instructions, and poor instruction do not guarantee that students will come out being able to read or do simple math. And here's, an ex here's a, a picture, a, a comparison across different countries again. So this left side 
shows the proportion of, the, of, 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 uh, of uh, students, 15 to 19, who have, com by the, uh, who have completed different grade levels. And this is their corresponding probability or percentages who can, uh, who can read a simple sentence. And so you can see that this uh, the Mali, which has the lowest curve here, also has uh, the lowest proportion of, of, of uh, students who can read. But then isn't it amazing that even though some of these students reach grade four or grade five, that not everybody can read a basic simple sentence. So here, lots of numbers to look at, but if you just take a look at the, at the last column, uh, you will, these are the proportion of the population who are literate. Uh, these are adult, uh, this is the adult population, but those are, you, you have numbers that are 17 percent, uh, I'm sorry, 15 percent for Mali, uh, 25 percent for Benin, uh, 35 percent for Nepal. These are low literacy rates. So I said many students also don't learn what the curriculum contains. Uh, we've been focusing on literacy and, and reading. Uh, here's math. This was a study recently completed at, at, the, at the World Bank. Here are, at the bottom, are simple math functions, uh, part of a, a test that were uh, that was given to uh, students who finished class three. And this is the proportion of students in, at the end of class three who were able to do the sim simple uh, math fu functions. And you can see that uh, three plus four doesn't get you to 100%. And then here is uh, an international test given mostly to OEC, the Western Europe, Japan, Korea, a few, and a few developing countries. Um, and this just gives us a comparison in math and in reading, uh, comparing, let's say, Indonesia and Thailand with uh, countries like Korea and the United States. And you see here, uh, the, the, the middle points here are the, the average uh, scores of, of students. So you don't get, you don't get 100% for the U.S. either. All right, but you do ha have uh, sort of these middle income countries of Thailand who are still pretty far below the uh, achievement in the United States and in the Czech Republic. This is uh, in honor of Jan here. <laughs> All right, so why do we care about education? So I thought I didn't need to show you a slide about education and earnings and uh, and economic development, but I did want to show you a slide about education and child development. It's something that, for example, a lot of uh, probably economists in the government would not necessarily recognize that uh, we, have these, we have these positive effects of educating in particular mothers. Uh, and these are the ways that mother's education can affect child's growth. Lower fertility rates, better antenatal care, better nutrition for children, more hygienic practices, more cognitive stimulation, that means uh, code word for more reading to young children, for example, and more, more use of health services. Right? So these are, these are actually results from many different studies across the world, from many, many countries around the world. And then I was, I was saying, saying that it's not just putting children to, in classrooms, that's a challenge for countries. It's also making sure that, that the children learn something. And something that we often don't see from the literature is, is the benefits from educational quality. It means from the learning itself. And so I wanted to show this slide, which uh, shows that educational quality, besides just completing years of education, has a powerful effect on individual earnings and on economic growth. In the U.S., a one standard deviation increase in math performance at the end of high school uh, has been shown to, to translate into 12 percent higher annual earnings now. Um, this were from studies by uh, Hanishek and Wisman. They, also, they are also showing uh, that this kind of result 
Uh, you see also from looking at cr a cross-country study, which includes several OECD countries. And finally, at the bottom here, you see that even uh, the, qu the quality of education as well ha is, is can be associated or is associated with reduced crime, improved health of children, and improved civic participation. So not just years of schooling, but also the quality of uh, education. So end of part one. So I wanted to show a very simple uh, school system because I want to show you what, what needs to get done to do something about, uh, about these various uh, educational challenges. And I wanted to emphasize that in this simple, simplified, simplistic school system, households are a big player. And so, because in, in recognition of that, governments have been using demands, what are known as demand-side interventions. So it's not the case that if you build a school, children will come. That's, that's the, the premise, is that there's no guarantee that if there are schools, children will be there. And so therefore, there's need for demand-side interventions. And, and different governments, different countries have, have experimented with various interventions. So among them are stipends, which, can be, which are cash payments made to families to offset the direct schooling costs as well as the opportunity costs of going to school. There are also targeted vouchers. So are, these are cash payments to, to families based on enrollments, allowing for enrollment in public or private schools. Uh, so not necessarily uh, uh, cash payments in addition to the, the cost of the tuition. This is really the cost of the tuition. The, uh, another, another one, a third one, is just to abolish school fees. And several uh, countries have really done that and have seen uh, increases in enrollment rates. A fourth is uh, for beyond uh, the primary level and, and also beyond the secondary level are student loans, allowing uh, students a chance to go to higher education. And finally, communi community grants and community financing. These are funds given to the community and usually linked to enrollment numbers. So I'll say something more about these demand-side interventions. As I said, they are meant to address some of the root causes of low schooling attendance that come mainly from the pressures on the family. So addressing low family income, addressing high opportunity costs of, of sending kids to school, and sometimes also the cultural barriers. They are uh, saying that if you pay families to send their children to school, some of the costs that are not economic, some of the costs that are, might be cultural barriers, such as, let's say, the, the, the reasons why girls do not stay in school, that you can offset some of that cost by uh, subsidy. In the best programs, therefore, the subsidies vary by grade and gender. To, again, to be able to target specifically what's causing uh, children not to go to school, what's causing children to drop out early from school. What the experience from some of these demand-side interventions show is that by giving transfers to family, families are empowered to improve their own welfare. And some of these programs actually give the payments directly to mothers rather than to fathers. Again, on the, because of evidence that uh, resources given to the mothers are more likely to go to children than resources given to uh, fathers. Now, one problem with, this, with these programs is that leakage can be, can be large, and so a big part of the cost of running these programs is to make sure that the actual beneficiaries are reached. Yeah? And in some of the cases that I've seen, sometimes these, just this monitoring, these, these, the cost related to stopping the leakage is about 15% of the total cost of the program. Um, and I've seen uh, some cases where, where you have you know, basically a big industry just to make sure that, the, that the, the subsidies do go to the actual beneficiaries. So here's a list of demand-side education programs 
uh, I know of in developing countries, from Argentina's Bono Escolar to uh, Mexico's Progresa, Colombia's Becas Pases, Haiti's, uh, I'm not gonna try to s pronounce that, to uh, Venezuela's Subsidio Familiar. And I want to focus on three very quickly and what I know about them in terms of their uh, features and also the impact that uh, have been shown from various evaluations of these programs. Let's start with uh, the Mexico's Progreso or Oportunidades program, which is actually very famous now, as I would, I would, I would say. Uh, it's not actually focused only on education. In fact, it has a multi-sectoral focus. Health, there's nutrition, there's education. But for the, on the education part, the, the, the emphasis is to improve school, school enrollment, especially for girls and, uh, and, and, and for kids to stay in school. And the, re and the emphasis on girls' education is shown by the fact that by the time uh, students go get into the secondary level, there's a higher subsidy for, there's a higher transfer for girls than there is for boys in recognition of the fact that there are stronger pressures for girls to drop out of school. There's also uh, an improvement, there's also grants to improve uh, supply and the quality of, of, of schools, and there's also a cultivation of parental responsibility and appreciation for education, which really translates to parental training programs that come with this subsidy. There have been, there have been many studies, many evaluations of the Mexico program. Um, the impact shown uh, have been, uh, has been higher enrollment in secondary school, lower grade repetition and dropout, uh, higher rates of re-entry even when uh, students have dropped out. Uh, these studies, the, the program has run long enough that studies have also looked at long run impact and the long run impact is uh, that there's been an increase in completed schooling for 14 year olds. So, See, this, this grant starts from grade three. So these, if you, if you just follow uh, the kids over time, what you see is a, an increase in the number of years completed by almost a year, almost a grade. There's also been reduced repetition rates even for children who were too young to be in the program. So even for children who are grade one and grade two, they've also seen that they are less likely to drop out in the areas where the program exists. So the parents are, are, are anticipating the benefits that they will receive from the program. Bangladesh's uh, female stipend program is directly targeted only to girls in secondary education. And when I first became acquainted with this program uh, was when it was just being taken over by the government and by the donor community. It had actually started as a small, as a family affair as a family donation to one sub-district and then it, it, it and then USAID came and, 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 and expanded it to I think three or, or five districts more and then at that point in time it, 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 it got attention and the, the larger donor community became interested mm -hmm. Norway became interested the World Bank became interested USA ADB Asian Development Bank became interested and it, it, it went from si five to six sub-districts to covering all rural sub-districts. So they were targeted to uh, the secondary level. It, the, the stipend is actually quite small, but it, it covers 50% of the cost of textbooks, uniforms. I guess what I said was small was really the, there's an amount deposited in the name of the, of the beneficiary and in the bank, in a rural bank. And that is really small. And when I went around to, to, to interview some of the beneficiaries, some of the girls in the rural areas said, you know, uh, you should not just be targeting rural areas. You should be targeting the poorer girls in the rural areas because really the pocket money that you give it, this program gives us is so small. And it will actually make much more of a difference to the poor uh, girls. But this was a political that's a political uh, risk for the government to actually target with, even within rural areas. And that's why 
the government itself, even uh, in spite of the advice of the donor community, did not want to target within sub-districts. Once they picked a rural sub-district, they wanted to just give it to all the girls in the sub-district because they felt that, you know, otherwise, you know, how do you, how do you measure who's poor, who's not poor, and they, they wanted to not, uh, not get into that. That is, by the way, one of the, the challenges of these kinds of demand side, in these kinds of interventions. Yes, Zoe. Yes. So in the schools, the, so there were schools that were admitting these girls, and they were the, the program schools. Um, I saw it myself because it, earlier in the program, basically the girls uh, are in the back of the classrooms, and there are only a few of them. By the time uh, the program was more mature, uh, really half or more of the classrooms were girls. Um, yes, that was the case. And uh, I think most of it was that they were, you had larger classrooms. You had larger classrooms, you also had boys transferring to some of the schools where um, uh, maybe were not part of the program. Because there wasn't space available. Because, possibly because there were not space available in those. But I have a feeling that what's going on is that there was some, some trading off as well. It actually, if you send your daughter to, sc to school and the, the daughter got the stipend, you, that, that daughter has money in the bank. So, so what's the, the percentages mean that the total fraction of students attending school is increased? Uh, no, uh, enrollment, rates, enrollment rates increased a lot. First of all, the, the government abolished fees at the primary level. So that itself really increased enrollment rates at the secondary level. Secondly, once they got to the secondary level, you had this program uh, kicking in. And if the, the, this study is based on, on Mark Pitts and Shahid Kanker's work, and unfortunately, as, as some of you who are, who've been involved in impact evaluation know that you know, if you come kind of in the middle or late in the program, you don't, you're not able to, to, to do all the kinds of controls you want. And so they, they themselves are, are are, are uh, you know, they, they apologize for, well, not quite apologize, but they're not so sure about some of the magnitude of this impact. But um, I think there, there was a re reduction in the participating schools in the number, in enro male enrollment rates. So in Columbia's targeted uh, voucher program was in the mid-90s uh, when I got involved. And this was a targeted only to the urban areas because uh, the premise was that the urban schools were overcrowded, especially in the poorer areas uh, in the cities. And so the, the, the voucher program was going to be targeted to allow the poor poor kids in the cities to go to, to use the excess capacity in the private sector, right? So uh, the voucher was given to students themselves. They could, only to those who, who completed uh, primary, the primary level in a public school. And then they had to find, uh, they had to be accepted in a public, in a private high school that was uh, participating and uh, they would then have to prove that they are eligible by bringing a utility bill which has a, which indicates the, the socioeconomic stratum of their neighborhood. And only the children who lived in the two bottom socioeconomic strata in the community could, uh, were eligible for this program. There were also several studies of this, uh, of the impact of, the, of this program and the study sh uh, studies found that there were the voucher winners, and I'm calling their, them winners, by the way, because in fact, these evaluations were based on the municipalities which did conduct lotteries. And they conducted lotteries because the demand for the voucher was exceeded the supply of the vouchers. And why, why was there not enough uh, supply? It was because the municipalities had to co-fund 
the cost of the vouchers. So they were limiting the, the supply of the vouchers and the demand exceeded and the way the municipalities uh, dealt with that was to conduct lotteries, which was handy because for people who do impact evaluation, that gave the randomization needed to, to try to, to estimate an impact. And there were also, we then uh, developed a, a, a test and conducted a test both for uh, the students who were the voucher winners as well as, well as for the losers. And, uh, and we found that there was an increase and in, there was a higher, the, the winners were more likely to have a higher test score um, than the voucher losers. And then uh, my co-authors have, have, have then proceeded to do longer term analysis looking at the probability that the same students who got the vouchers early on in their secondary uh, schooling were going to complete secondary schooling, then take the school leaving test, and then go to college. So there have been impact evaluations of that as well. So you can see that uh, demand side interventions are actually, by the way, under this economic, global economic downturn, these kinds of programs have really been very good platforms for actually for, for governments to put more money in because they tend to be targeted towards poorer students. And so, for example, the Mexico Progresa Oportunidades program has just, uh, is, is expanding now and has just actually asked for a, a loan from the World Bank. Indonesia also has a school grant program and again, they have just are using this existing uh, school program, school grant program, to help families who are moving from private schools, I'm sorry, moving from, yeah, moving from private schools to public schools. Because of these tendencies to do this, governments now don't want to, to overcrowd the public schools, so they're trying to give grants to the private schools. Okay? So these kinds of programs have been very good platforms for actually uh, try, uh, for the measures to try to address the impact of the global economic crisis. So again, a reminder of what the school, this, of the school, uh, simple school system and the various players in this. Uh, and we focus, let me focus on uh, interventions that are targeted towards uh, schools. So first, very simply, governments build school buildings. They establish schools, build school buildings, add classrooms. There's a wide diversity across the countries we work in uh, about the su pub, uh, supply of public schools. And one indication of this is the large variation in the average distance to primary schools from households across uh, the co different countries. So you can go from an average of less than, much less than a kilometer in Bangladesh to over seven kilometer in kilometers in, in uh, Chad. Uh, and in, at the secondary level, the, the, the distances are larger, of course, uh, and they tend to be positively correlated. That means to say, in some places that are, uh, let's say, more sparsely populated, there's lo there are longer distances to, private, uh, to primary schools and therefore also longer distances to, to, uh, to secondary schools. And in uh, what they're, what they found in Chad is that a distance more than one kilometer was sufficient to actually for, for girls to leave school. And then in the, province, in the state of Uttar Pradesh in India, uh, the government has adopted a norm of 1.5 kilometer, 1.2 kilometers as a, a sort of a, a, something that they want to be able to maintain. And so I guess th what that means is that would signal to them uh, bigger, bigger distance than 1.2 kilometers would signal uh, a need to build another school. There were uh, just one example of a school construction program that was evaluated was in Indonesia in the early 70s. There was a massive school construction project and an evaluation has looked at what such a simple, simple but big uh, school construction project could do about enrollment rates and it uh, you could really see the impact of that over time as uh, you look at the uh, average schooling and then the wages of the birth population cohort that was affected by that increase in the uh, school construction. 
But schools are not schools without teachers, or at least, at least in the kinds of schools we can think of right now. So teachers are critical uh, participants in the learning process, but here's, uh, here, here's some information about uh, some of the problems related to teachers, one of which is that there's actually uh, large absenteeism rates in several countries. Uh, absences are considerably higher than could be accounted for when you uh, take into account non-official teaching duties, such as staffing uh, election uh, polls, uh, stations, uh, or uh, training. And uh, this study, which was conducted by some of my colleagues and some uh, people in, uh, at Harvard, found that if you do a spot check of schools, because you know there are absenteeism records, right? But, but we normally, I, I certainly suspect those ad administrative records myself, how, how accurate they really are. But a spot check was done in these countries. So they were, schools were visited unannounced. And then uh, if the teacher was supposed to be there and the teacher was not, that teacher was marked as absent. And this study, so uh, was, there was a lot of uh, uh, uptake of this study in the press, especially in the local press. I was in Indonesia at the time that the study was, uh, was launched, was announced, and the, the editorial pages was full of the discussion about this, of this uh, numbers. Why is it that in Indonesia, how can the government allow 20% of the teachers not to be where they're supposed to be? Uh, how, how could that be? And apparently, my colleagues who were in India at that time also saw a huge uh, you know, uh, to-do about the numbers in India of 25%. And I think it's not because people, the government doesn't know about teacher absence. It's just that put, giving this problem numbers is uh, is very important. Are the children unattended, or is there a substitute teacher? I think it varied quite a bit. In some cases, they were there but not studying. No, these are, there are no uh, no substitute teachers. Because usually, when there are substitute teachers, it's because the, those absences are actually excused. They are expected. So the somebody has arranged for a substitute teacher. So when, when governments have um, limited capacity to deliver, all right, so this is, even though uh, education is thought to be uh, the province for government still, right, uh, governments cannot actually address all of the challenges, all of the uh, needs of the education sector. And so private sector choices make sense, and they make sense even for poor communities and for poor people. So our, our, um, our uh, assumption that private, school, private schooling is mainly for the elite isn't actually uh, isn't true in, in, in many cases. Because in, even in the poorest communities, uh, private schools can be the only choice for, uh, for students. And that's because the private sector is not necessarily a for-profit. They can be non-profit local, they can be run by non-profit local and international NGOs. They can be faith-based, they can be owned, managed by faith-based organizations and also individual donors. And the, the share of enrollment in private schools is actually not, even that one is not an accurate measure of the degree of private sector participation. Because think of, who runs buses, who, who provides school lunches, who provides textbooks or produce textbooks, et cetera, et cetera. So the private sector is much more involved in the education process, uh, education system, even in the public education system. And uh, so markets, the way they are regulated, is also uh, an important question to address, uh, even in public education. Uh, I don't imagine that you would be able to see all of this. Or, but this was just a typology of the different types of private sector involvement in education. So the first one is, is the one that we usually think of, the privately managed uh, private schools. 
but there are many others. And in the US, you can see, uh, you can think of charter schools, for example. Right? In, uh, uh, you can have service delivery contracts, such as the one that I described for Columbia. You can have, in some cases, the community builds the school, provides the building, but then the government pays for the teachers. And then the auxiliary services I was mentioning, which was lunch, textbooks, transportation. So I wanted to make sure that, that you know, when you think about public education, it doesn't mean that the private sector and ent enterprise sector is not at all involved, because they are. And I think that there are so many myths, and one of the myths is that we have a clear dichotomy between public and private education. But we don't, because you can have provision, who's going to provide, who's going to manage, who's going to, fin to finance. We might agree that for basic education, the government should be financing because of the social returns, let's say, to education. But it doesn't mean that the government has to, to manage the schools, especially in places where the, the management capa capacity uh, is limited. Uh, if we want to actually expand education, especially at the secondary level, we have to think about how to bring in uh, the private sector. So these are the myths. All private schools are expensive, elite schools. No. In Indonesia, when I did a study of the public financing of schools, the, the private schools in schools outside Java, outside Jakarta and outside Java, received more public financing than the public schools in Jakarta. So that tells you that you have to sort of dissociate provision and management and financing. Uh, I will go, uh, won't even look at this. All, it, all I wanted to show is that basic education remains the province of governments, but increasingly subnational governments are taking over, in, especially in decentralized uh, governments. And also that poor families are willing to pay, especially when the public schools do not uh, meet the quality, do not teach students what they're supposed to learn. Um, households, families are willing to send their children to private schools and pay uh, what, what it takes. And, 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 and the, uh, the cost may not be uh, the, the, the high cost that we usually associate with private schools. Um, this is just a comparison of the, this is from a recent study again in, in Pakistan and uh, showing the differences in the test scores of students in public schools and private schools in, in uh, the, the province of Punjab, showing that, in fact, the, the private schools were doing better than the public schools. And so there's been a, a, an unprecedented increase in private schooling in uh, rural areas in, in the Punjab. And, one, and this study speculates that it's because the quality of the public schools have, have decreased so much that parents do, do not want to keep their students, their children in public schools. So, but more resources. Right, so we've been talking about uh, some financing, but actually what's very, what a, biggest, a very big challenge for uh, people who want to, to improve the education systems in developing countries is actually to change uh, institutions. And what do we mean by this? So one is that we need to think about the players in the system. And I kept bringing to you that oval figure which shows the different players in the system. You had central government and local governments. And you can have an assignment of different functions between the central government and the local governments, where the central government, let's say, might hire teachers, but then the local governments provide the schools. Or in some case, in some countries, even the local governments and even the schools are able to hire and fire teachers. So different, different countries are experimenting. I wouldn't say experiment. They've, they've reformed their education systems. And so the power of hiring and firing teachers, uh, procure, procuring materials, and may have shifted from the central government to the, to the local government. And uh, trying to undertake such a large reform uh, as this moving the, 
uh, authority and power and responsibility from one part of the government to another is really a, a huge, huge challenge. And one of the challenges there for the central government when it decides to do that is whether it has the system of information and evaluation so that even though the, the, the authority and the power has been devolved to the local level and even to school management committees in the schools, that the central government is still able to make sure, to ensure that the, the quality of education being received by the students is uh, of, uh, of some level of quality. So this kinds of a, a change in a shift of authority and power and responsibility has to be accompanied also by a, a, an accountability system that works. And then there are these incentive mechanisms uh, within uh, education systems. For example, if the teachers are hired and can be fired only by the central government, what does it really mean to devolve power to the local government? When teachers actually take up, the salaries of teachers usually account for 80 to 90 percent of the budgets for education. What does it really mean to decentralize, to devolve education to the local government or to the schools? So these, these kinds of, of, of uh, incentive mechanisms have to be uh, thought through. They're, they're not uh, easy to, it's not easy to make sure that all of them are aligned and consistent. And I was, I was working on Indonesia when the government was decentralizing in 2001, 2002. And there were laws, different laws, and, and, and uh, it was very difficult to, to see how some of the provisions of the law could actually be implemented given, given, who, given where particular functions were located. So who was hiring, who was hiring teachers, hiring te who was evaluating teachers, et cetera, et cetera. So it was very difficult to see what was the, you know, to what extent the reform could be, could really be implemented given what the, what the uh, relationships of power, ex uh, ex how they, uh, what sort of pa relationships of power existed. Okay, but this, uh, such, Big reforms cannot be done really without strong political commitment. And uh, this is probably one of the most, both most heartwarming as well as the most uh, heartbreaking experiences for working in this area is that it's heartwarming when I meet, when finally a minister of education comes who is a real reformer and who has, who wants to do the right thing. And it's really heartbreaking when that minister, because he's, he or she has done such a good job, is promoted to something else, you know, higher level. And then that, that position becomes vacant and then we have to do it all over again. Because really the strong political commitment of a reformer is necessary because that simplified school system is actually a very complex school system. And um, education is something, because of the because teachers tend to be probably the biggest part of the civil service, it's also a very important political source of political power for politicians. And so uh, many of these decisions are not I about the education systems. It's not, all, it's not independent of the fact that we are only, let's say, 10 months from an election. The other lesson, I think, is that time is essential to affect systemic change. Uh, but again, reform or politicians have four years or six years. So they, they have their mind focused on, I'm going to do something where I can see some, a change in four years or within the, the time that I'm in, in, in office. And many of these changes take, take time. Uh, the new U.S. Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, was in the Chicago Public Schools. And if you read the history of the, the reform of the Chicago Public Schools, you will see that you know, you, 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 you think you've got it right and then you reform it and you reform it again and, and, and it, the, the, you, you don't always get it right the first time. Weak institutional capacity. You have poor countries, usually have uh, uh, a, a lower, a smaller group of educated people who are going to be 
uh, the people who will implement the reform. Uh, it's just uh, weak institutional capacity is one of the, the biggest challenges, I think, of, of, of implementing. Um, then change such as this will create conflict and anxiety. When I was working on Nicaragua for a school autonomy reform, uh, the teachers in the schools were very anxious because the, the idea of the reform was to give more power to parents. Because before, there was the school, it was all, they, were only, they were only advisors, they were only consultants in the school uh, consultative uh, councils. They were not managers. They were not directive. They could not take decisions. With the school autonomy reform, those parents who were sitting in the school committees got power. So all of a sudden, they had the same number of votes as teachers do. And that, if you read the, uh, the, uh, the colleague who wrote about the anxiety, the angst of the teachers suffered during that time, because how dare these parents who are uneducated themselves be in the same, you know, having the same power as we do in, in making decisions about the school. Uh, so ref that's a, a, a sort of a, a small version of these conflict and, and anxiety that, that change can, can, uh, can produce. Uh, teachers' unions are one of the most powerful uh, groups in some, uh, some of the countries we work in. And I think reforms are not possible, deep reform is not possible unless uh, there is support from teachers. And then I've already mentioned uh, central uh, c conflicts, let's say, between central and local governments. So finally, what um, does the World Bank do and what does in particular more broadly, what can development aid do for education? Because let's face it, even though, let's say, the World Bank is the largest external funder for education, our aid is just a drop, drop in the bucket. The real finance, financing of education comes from governments themselves. So the big challenge for us is how do we use development aid, aid given it's only a small part of funding? For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's only 13% of total, of total funding for education, and uh, larger for some countries, much smaller for other countries. So what can we do? Well, one is that we can support an advocate for specific reforms, and experience says that it's possible to do that. For example, education for all, the move, the, the uh, support for uh, girls' education, support for better governance in education, and the focus on poor populations. That's something that I think the donor community have, has been able to do. Secondly, assist in developing and implementing more evidence-based education policies. As I mentioned, sometimes many policies are actually based on political uh, considerations. And I think that it's possible to change this. Experience from uh, working in, in several countries indicate that there are people who, there are uh, policymakers who would like to know what they can do and what, uh, what, uh, and what policies are supported by evidence. So, uh, for example, Mexico's Progresa is, 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 is one case in point. So data collection, knowledge creation, and exchange of information is one of the other things that development aid can do. We can help countries pilot new education policies because po politicians, are impatient. They want things right away, and a little bit of success, they want it to expand, scale up uh, a, a project immediately. Uh, but we need to be able to say, look, let's pilot these uh, new ideas, let's adopt, adapt them to local conditions, let's evaluate them. And we need to do more of that. I don't think the development community does enough of that. And lastly, we can do a mo facilitate more learning across countries because uh, we, the, the term people use is the South-South learning. I think it really is important to realize that there are many more commonalities across countries than, than there are, uh, I think, we would accept. And that Chile uh, experiences can be valuable to El Salvador, can be valuable to Botswana. There are things we can learn from uh, across the countries, even given, even accepting the differences across them. So I'd like to end with a slide that I began with, uh, just to say that this was, uh, I think, education is a hell of a thing. 
I think it's a very difficult thing to, I think we've made a lot of progress, but it's really difficult to, to make sure that the gains from that progress we've achieved in the last uh, decade, two decades, uh, will not be threatened by this econ global economic downturn. That's something that we are worrying very much about, uh, that those gains are going to be threatened, that, that, that schools will close, that, that uh, house families will pull their children out of school, that, um, that the quality of schools will suffer because non-salary inputs are not going to be available, that teachers' salaries are not going to be paid on time. And that will, that will actually slow down, I believe, the ability of countries to recover faster. If you go back to the experience of Europe after the Second World War, human capital was very important to the experience of recovery and uh, reconstruction. And we have to, th we have to use the, the lessons from that experience to say we have to try to make sure that the gains from education we've seen over the past couple of decades uh, are not threatened, that we're able to sustain uh, the, the positive progress. Thank you very much. So I'm open to questions. Um, uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation. I'm a doctoral student from the School of Education. I used some um, data from World Bank, like World Development Indicators. Yes. I wonder how the World Bank collect and process that data from each country. And uh, we wrote paper uh, using statistical method instead of descriptive data to analyze those data. But um, some, some researchers don't recognize the, you know, mm -hmm. the method mm -hmm. because they think the um, data collection method is very rough uh, and different countries using different uh, methods and uh, conceptions to uh, collect that data. So um, they don't work the statistical method. How do you think? Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks for the question. Do you mind if I collect a couple more questions before I answer? Yes. Um, hello, I'm from South Africa, and so uh, I was very interested in your presentation, and a big piece that was missing for me was around HIV and AIDS, and I know that adds a whole complex layer, extra layer to what you're talking about. Um, but I'd just like to hear some of your thoughts about mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Oh. With regard to the institutional context and governance, does the World Bank have what it views as a best practice model for the assignment of functions to different levels? Or do you go in and every context is so different, there is no such thing as a best practice model on institutional design. Thank you. So, okay, so let me, let me then um, answer this first. So for data collection, uh, in the World Development Indicators, those are actually coming from UNESCO by, arrange, by agreement with UNESCO. Education data there are from, uh, and, and UNESCO collects them directly from the countries. And you're absolutely right that those, uh, although they train UNESCO is supposed to train the people who provide the education uh, data. Uh, there will be some variation across countries. That's right. Um, and there's, a, there's been a, a big improvement in the quality of uh, data, I think, from UNESCO. There's a, the UNESCO uh, Institute for Statistics is in Montreal, and, uh, and, and they've made a lot of progress uh, with support from, from the World Bank in terms of collecting data. Now, having said that, okay, having said that, there are also many more household survey data that actually provide, uh, that allow a serious researcher to look at, uh, enroll, to, to check enrollment rates and years of schooling. And I, I tend to do that. I tend to, to look to see whether patterns are very different between the numbers that are given by the government and numbers that I get from household survey data. So, um, does that sort of answer? 
of the WDI, well, it's the best that you're going to get in terms of, 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 of sort of accepted data. I, I myself, and, and besides, you, won't get, you will get them at the country level. If you want to use, if you want to do research at the micro level, you, you won't be using that, right? You will be using household survey data. But for across the countries, I tend to use, I, 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 I can, I, like some of these things, I, use, I go directly to the, either the demographic and health surveys plus the mixed survey plus the living standards measurement survey. So a combination of household surveys and you get about 50, 60, 70 countries. You don't get the same uh, number of countries as you would from the World Development Indicators, which is from the UNESCO data. HIV AIDS. Yes, I've actually, uh, there are two, two things that I can think of. First, and I did have a slide actually on HIV AIDS before, which is to show that in places where there's a larger gap in the education level between men and women, they're the countries that tend to have higher uh, prevalence of HIV AIDS. But that, it's sort of old data, so I, I didn't want to, from the, it was from the uh, middle, mid 90s, so I wasn't, I don't have um, more new data. But HIV AIDS is also very important when you think about the supply of teachers. And a colleague of mine has looked at um, absenteeism, for example, in Zambia, and it has found that a lot of uh, teacher absenteeism is because of HIV AIDS. And there, there's no hope of those teachers actually coming back. You don't just say, you know, you have to improve your absentee, your, your, your presence, because they're sick. Right? So HIV AIDS really has a, an effect on the supply of teachers. And also uh, orphanhood, okay? And so orphanhood uh, and the fact that especially dub double orphans have lower, I believe, lower levels of, of enrollment rates and education. Uh, and in places where, let's say, what children see as, if children don't, or in families don't see a, a big return to education, it will take a lot from, of, of, of incentives to actually make sure that the kids remain in school. So I think there are many, many, uh, many ways that the two interact. And I have a colleague uh, in where my new new place that has looked at various some of these issues. And if you want, his name is Don Bundy, and if you, you know, and he's been working, <coughs> excuse me, with some people at the London School of Tropical Medicine. And if you want to get some of the uh, things that they've just produced, I'll I'll be happy to send them to you. Is there a best practice for, for governance? I think, I think there isn't because first the countries tend to decide them themselves. The, the main, I think where, where, where we should be uh, straight about is that there should be consistency. That you know, where, when, you give, when you give responsibility, you know, accountability, if you make schools accountable for what they produce, you have to give them some power. If they don't have power over teachers, they can't choose teachers, can't fire teachers, can't evaluate teachers, cannot train teachers, what does it mean to give them the responsibility? And I think that's in, in the work, for example, that I did for, for, for Indonesia and for East Asian countries, that was what I was looking at, was the consistency of where the power lay, lie, lies and where the responsibility lies. And they just have to be aligned. So, but, but countries, it's usually the countries, we don't decide whether, you know, whether the country's going to, to decentralize or not. There is, however, a trend towards more uh, devolution of responsibility and power to local governments and to schools. Today I use a talk focusing on primary and secondary education, but on um, uh, higher education, and the vocational training will be a major challenge for middle-income countries. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I may be wrong, but uh, I think I have read the report about assistance, but one assistance to vocational training, was the result was mixed. Um, um, maybe, so, I don't know. Uh, so could you tell me about the challenges of uh, higher education or vocational training? Thank you. Yes, Professor. Do you have a chance to consider the question of languages as 
construction and learning, and the uh, production of teaching materials, as well as the other variables mentioned, and, and, and considering the educational gap between people. Thank you. Yes. Um, my question is about uh, curriculum development. Um, I know the World Bank is engaged in a process with uh, local governments such as Lebanon and engaging uh, uh, or kind of collaborating the efforts in order to develop their curriculums. To what level is the World Bank involved in such effort? Do they play a mandate role, a consultative role? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Um, yes, on higher education, definitely a, for the middle income countries. Uh, as I, I'm sorry, I, I keep going back to my work on, on Indonesia, but although that work focused very much on the governance issues, the first time I, gave, I presented the, the work to a, a large group, bigger than your group, of, of, of government officials, the very first question I was asked had nothing to do with governance. It was about, what, does the World Bank recommend general education or vocational <laughs> education? And so it's very much, I realize, that it's, it's a question that's very much in the minds of, of officials because of this link between school and work. Skill, education, skill, you know, education is not just for, you know, enjoying the arts and so forth. It's supposed to lead to productive skills, supposed to lead to work. So clearly that's a very important. Uh, now, we do have some, uh, some work on that. In the past, the work, the evaluation of vocational and training programs has, been, has produced dismal, dismal results. Uh, they, they tend to be, these, these programs tend to be the sort of ghetto of uh, education systems, et cetera. That's not the case for some countries, of course. Um, so, th but there's a revival of this because of this, uh, because of the globalization, concern about being more, comp for school, uh, uh, countries to be more competitive. Um, but our, our own staff are, you know, it's, it's a very difficult topic to look at because for one thing, vocational is not homogeneous. They are, you can have four year vocational and technical uh, programs, you can have two years, you can have one year, you have half, and, and when the government asks about uh, vocational and technical education, they tend to uh, talk about a, a, a very large, uh, set of different kinds of delivery. Um, so th this is an area where I think we need to do some more work uh, following from that work done, I think it was in the 80s when there was a lot of uh, work done on vocational and technical education. Higher education, we've just completed uh, some s a study on world-class universities because uh, countries are very interested actually in building uh, good universities, centers of excellence. So I think this is, a, if you're more interested in that, uh, certainly that's something that I can send to you. Now the, the World Bank, when, it, when we began working on education, we began working on higher education. The first <coughs> loans of the World Bank was not to the primary level, it was to the higher, to higher education uh, institutions. So this is something that we're, we're just uh, beginning after supporting basic education from the, 19, 19, from the late 80s uh, up to today. Even now, as you know, with the uh, Education for All and the, the Millennium Development Goals for 2015, we're still focused on, because we want poor countries to, to catch up, we are focusing <coughs> still on basic education. But we know that even for poor countries, there's a lot of interest for uh, secondary education and higher education. And it, it, it's only natural as you increase uh, enrollment rates at the primary level, kids will eventually get to the higher education level. So, so this is something that we certainly have to do. Languages and inequality, uh, I think uh, very important. Um, since I'm not an educator directly, I sort of uh, won't say a whole lot about that except to say that um, my uh, educator colleagues would say, it's best to instruct in your mother tongue up to grade two or three, because then it's more, uh, a, a child is better able to learn the concepts that in a language the child is more familiar with. I've been doing some work on in eth ethno-linguistic groups. So, 
so inequalities by ethno-linguistic uh, groups. And one thing that I'm finding is that first, um, in, in many cases, if a, if, a, if a minority group in terms of the ethno-linguistic group is very disadvantaged, you'd, the supply of teachers for that group is also very limited. That's one of the challenges. And then if you have a country like Laos where there are at least 50 language groups, and that's an understatement, what the, think about the cost implications of producing school textbooks uh, in the mother tongue, and where some of those languages do not even have written scripts that is still recognized today. In some of those uh, ethno-linguistic groups, the UNESCO, a certain part of UNESCO is actually helping develop script for those, uh, for those, uh, minor, for those uh, ethnic groups. So it's, yes, I think it's important to, to think about that language is, is, uh, helps uh, learning. How far to take it? Do you, do you offer uh, instruction in, uh, two languages, three languages, four languages, or in the case of Laos, uh, in how many languages would you offer? So I think that's, it's an important challenge to, to governments, but you can see where the, you know, how large the challenge is of that. And I, I, was, I was in a discussion, as part of a discussion with the uh, uh, Minister of Education in the Philippines, where, because the Philippines has 80 language groups also when they were trying to decide how many, so they, they, there, was a, there were many people who were experts on language, uh, language of instruction, and they were also saying, you know, look, we have to teach in the, in, the, in the native tongue. And then the question was, so how many? Right? And so there was a huge, dis long discussion about how many. Is it gonna be four? Is it gonna be eight? So not even 80, not even close to 80. So but even the, you know, four or eight, what, and what does that mean in terms of uh, teacher, uh, teacher training, teacher recruitment, uh, production of materials? Curriculum development. The, the, the World Bank does not really have, if, if there is a project that is involved in curriculum development, it's likely, the, the teams are likely to involve uh, one uh, local expert on that one. Because uh, to tell the truth, to be honest, we don't have a lot of curriculum experts anymore. So if there's going to be curriculum development, the, the develop, the, those experts aren't going to come from the World Bank. And I would, I would imagine that they would be coming from Lebanon. Uh, so this would be, the way these, these development of projects work is that the teams are formed, you, you do have international experts. But then there are also local experts, especially in this case of, for curriculum development. This is one area where countries are very sensitive about, and, so, and we recognize that. Thank you for the questions, I enjoyed them.